Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of Newport News School Board for Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. On behalf of the board, uh, on behalf of the members of the school board and Dr. Mitchell, I welcome each of you present this evening and those who are watching on TV and online. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. However, we do look a little lean this evening. We have one member of the school board who wishes to participate in our meeting electronically. As indicated in board policy, BEE, -E, electronic participation in meetings from remote location, the board member must make such request, cite the reason for remote attendance, and the board must approve the request by majority vote of the members present. School board member Marvin Harris has made such a request. Mr. Harris. Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, um, please share uh, your absence with us. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I request uh, to participate in this pu public meeting from my home due to medical. Thank you. So hearing Mr. Harris's request, what is the pleasure of the board? Do I have a motion? So moved. A second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Alger? Four. Best. Four. Amen. Four. Brown. Four. Soul's Law? Four. Motion carries by zero. Thank you. So that brings us to six members, and now the seventh, uh, our, our uh, prayers and thoughts are with Mr. Hunter. He has rec is home recovering from very major surgery. And he asked me to share to make sure that we all remember to get our screenings and our tests that are required of us annually. So our thoughts and prayers are with him and we look forward to him joining us very, very soon. Okay, we will begin tonight's meeting with the invocation and pledge of the flag. Here to do the honors are two students from McIntosh Elementary School, Alondra Armstead Curbelo and Christian Badillo. So I'll have the first one come up and do our invocation. Hi, share a little bit about yourself and then you can share your uh, devotion for us. I love to do anything that I have time for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> yes, I love that. And I am, and I would do anything for my family members. Oh. Oh. I will cancel anything for them. <laughs> oh, wow. They're blessed to have you. <laughs> Did you have something else you'd like to share with us today? No, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Good evening, members of the school board and members of the audience. My name is Alondra Armstead Carvello, and I am Vice President of the Student Council Association at McIntosh Elementary School. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I believe that every student deserves a chance to learn and grow in a safe and supportive environment. Let's work together to continue to make Newport News Public School a place where everyone feels included and valued. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Christian who will come forward and lead us in the pledge. And Christian, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself before you get us started with the pledge. My name is Christian Badillo and I'm a fifth grade student at McIntosh Elementary School. And my favorite subject is science because I really like archaeology. Mm. And that's one of my favorite, uh, one of my careers that I would like to do. And I would also like to be a basketball star. <laughs> you can do both. <laughs> Please stand as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, 
one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Christian. And I'd like to thank the families who have come to support our students from McIntosh. Would you all please stand? Thank you. Thank you for bringing them to share with us uh, today. And it definitely reminds us what we're here for. So thank you. Oh, is the assistant principal here too? On the, I, I'm sorry I didn't see you. Thanks for being here to support your students. So the next item on tonight's agenda is school board recognition. So Dr. Mitchell, will you please join me at the podium? We do not. Do we not? We have? do. We we have recognitions, and, but we but don't we have, don't to, have go to, to go to the podium. To the podium. Okay. We can enjoy Take it from away, here. Michelle. Yes. <laughs> Introducing Michelle Price, <laughs> our director of communications. <laughs> On behalf of the school board and superintendent, I have the pleasure of presenting this month's recognition. Governor Youngkin has proclaimed this week, Virginia School Principals Appreciation Week, a well-deserved nod that acknowledges the dedicated work of our school principals and their colleagues across the Commonwealth. His proclamation reads in part, whereas school principals work cooperatively to direct, develop, and inspire all members of the school staff and student body, and to communicate effectively with parents to engage them in the learning process. And whereas principals serve as educational leaders, managing the policies, regulations, and procedures necessary to ensure a safe and effective learning environment for all students in Virginia's public and private schools. And whereas principals and teachers are entrusted with the opportunity and responsibility of guiding, directing, nurturing, mentoring, and imparting knowledge to our children while they're at school, and whereas principals work collaboratively with teachers, staff, students, parents, and the community at large to proactively prepare students to be self-reliant and productive citizens. Whereas Virginia Schools Appreciation Week is an opportunity to recognize the hard work of Virginia school principals and to recognize the importance of school leaders in ensuring that every child has access to a quality education. And it is signed by Governor Glenn Youngkin. Each day in Newport News Public Schools, our principals engage our students, families, and staff to ensure that our students receive high quality instruction that prepares them to graduate college career and citizen ready. This is important hard work. So this evening, we salute and thank our principals and their, for their commitment to our students, academic and social development. Please join me in acknowledging our early childhood principals, which you see before you, Sue Waxman from Denby Early Childhood Center, Dr. Katie Smith from Marshall Early Learning Center, and Amy Gulick from Watkins Early Childhood Center. Let's give them a round of applause. And our elementary school principals, Tara Chalmers Harris at Achievable Dream Academy, Kelly Stewart at Carver Elementary, and Oriel Robertson Taylor at Charles Elementary. And Mary Jo Anastasia at Deer Park, Travis Humble at Discovery STEM Academy, and Karen Brown at Dutro. Jennifer Harnish at General Stanford, Ethel Francis at Greenwood, and Megan Almond at Heidenwood Elementary. Troy Touche at Hilton, Ebony Griffin at Jenkins, Dr. Angela Montpass at Katherine G. Johnson Elementary, Paula McConnell at Kiln Creek, Dylan Fail at Knollwood Meadows, Kamisha Davis at McIntosh, Dr. Dara White at Newsom Park, Dr. Melanie Cam at Palmer, Jackie Barber at Richneck, Tin Edwards at Riverside, Dr. Edward Van Dyke at Sanford, Shannon Pipkin at Saunders. Continues with Elizabeth Galbraith at Sedgefield, Carnesha Ford at Stony Run, and Suzanne Ramirez at Yates. Let's give a good congratulations and thank you to our elementary school principals. We also extend our thanks and appreciation to our middle school principals, 
Ramona Brower, who serves as Chief Will Dream Middle and High School Principal, Latia Smith at Crittenden Middle, Dr. Micah Smith at Ella Fitzgerald, Roland Noel at Gildersleeve, Lisa Gatz Daniel at Hines, Dr. Regina Stafford at Huntington, Jamitha, Russian at, Jamitha Ruffin at Passage, and Karen Basemore Person at Booker T. Washington Middle Schools. So thank you also to our middle school principals. And our high school principals, Dr. Adria Struthers at Denby, Dr. Erling Hunter at Heritage, Lisa Egoff at Minchville, Dr. Kelly Mason at Warwick, and Dr. Mary Hardesty at Woodside. Congratulations to them as well. Thank you. And rounding out our school leaders, our alternative and specialty program principals, William Taylor at Enterprise Academy, and Chris Smith at Point Option Virtual Learning Academy. Thank you and congratulations to them as well. So we gave our principals a night off. They didn't all have to come, but we did want to acknowledge their hard work. And to our dedicated principals, thank you for your tireless efforts, for your support, guidance, and encouragement that you provide every day to our students. Please join me in giving them one more final round of applause. Thank you, and that concludes tonight's recognitions, but we'd like to take a moment, and I'm gonna invite our school board chairman, our superintendent, to come down to the podium, um, because we'd like for Alondra and Christian to take a picture before you leave for the evening. Um, they delivered our invocation and pledged very beautifully, so would you please come forward? Absolutely. Thank you, we'll just take just a moment. Good night. Drive carefully. Do we have a spotlight? Do we have a we don't have one? That's what I told.
All right. Well, during our regular meetings, we provide time for the public to address the school board. These opportunities are scheduled in the early part of our agenda and towards the end of the meeting. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via email up until 30 minutes prior to our meeting time to be included in the official meeting record. For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments. Please understand that we will consider your concerns. We ask that you comply with our three minute time limit. As you begin your comments, a green light will come on, a yellow light signals that you have 30 seconds remaining, and a red light and beep indicate your time is up. As your name is called, please come forward. Reverend Natalie Chamberlain. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity I have to speak here. I'm Reverend Natalie Chamberlain, pastor of Hilton Christian Church, a congregation who welcomes and embraces people of all genders and gender identities. I'm a citizen and a resident of Newport News. I've spoken to you the past two months as pastor about the moral and ethical problems with the superintendent's procedures implementing the policy for protecting trans youth. The procedures not only don't protect trans youth, youth, they actually harm them. And as far as I can tell, that's the intent of the policy. I'm here tonight as the parent of a trans child who survived to adulthood against all odds. Maybe my story will soften hearts of those of you who are parents. My child came into my life when they were 16. They grew up in a home that was abusive in every way that abuse can be defined. The parents abused them under the guise of care and with the permission of the parents' church. The church attempted to fix my child with counseling that was, in reality, torture packaged as conversion therapy. It didn't work. It can't work. The church then tried exorcism. When this didn't work, they were banned from the church. They were also kicked out of their home. The details of all of this are horrific, but they are not mine to share. In the midst of all of this, the school system also failed them. Instead of showing any kind of care for what their life might be, they were placed on home study. They had too many absences to attend school any longer. When I met my child, they were teetering on the brink of destruction. I and the congregation I served at the time chose to love them unconditionally, exactly as they were. They found stable footing. That did not mean that all the issues disappeared. They remained depressed and at times suicidal, but they did now have an anchor in their storms. The suicidal ideations and attempts ended when they began their physical transition. This most certainly hasn't ended difficulties and hardships but it has given them the necessary sense of self to live with or overcome the difficulties they face. I am so proud to call this incredible human being my child. They have not only survived, but they have found ways to make life better for others in their communities. They refuse to give up because that would mean that those who harmed them in the name of love and appropriateness, would win. That is unthinkable for them and for me. Thank you. As Ash Chagnon, I know I'm butchering that last name, and I think I've done it more than once. Ash, tell me your last name. Uh, well, if you're going to pronounce it the fancy French way, it would be Chagnon. Chagnon. I was going it, to say that, too. We pronounce it, we pronounce it Chagnon for Chagnon, generations. Chagnon, okay. You're, you're doing no harm, then I'm trust going. me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Dr. Mitchell, members of the board. I'm here tonight to talk about Newport News' new propane bus grants and commend the city for taking steps towards a greener future. Except I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm actually here to talk about Governor Youngkin's transgender policies, again. But did you feel that? Did you feel that brief spark of hope that we might get to talk about something else tonight? I certainly did, and I certainly wish I could be here to do that. But as I said last month, 
as long as you allow Governor Yunkin's policies to remain in place, you are failing your students. It has now been two months since Dr. Mitchell unilaterally implemented Governor Yunkin's model policies. Two months of pain and suffering for transgender students. Originally, I was going to talk about the disappointment I feel in my elected officials, but the other day I had a conversation that changed my mind. I had the opportunity to talk to a supporter of Governor Yunkin's policies. During that conversation, I approached the issue with an open mind and with the willingness to be wrong. After all, if we're going to be intellectually honest, we have to be willing to admit when we're wrong. That's not how the conversation progressed, though. It rapidly deteriorated. I was told that being LGBT is a mind virus, that queer people like me are mentally ill and a blight on society, and that I was ludicrous to say that gender can change, and then I was told that biological sex is the only thing that matters. I'm not here to debate the veracity of these claims. You're all smart, well-educated people, and I, you don't need me to repeat ad nauseum the fact that these are not true. Instead, I want to challenge you to put yourselves in the shoes of a young transgender kid, a child now being subjected to policies backed by and supported by people who think all of the hateful things that were said to me. I'm not going to lie to you, the things that were said to me hurt. I myself am non-binary, I have struggled with my gender identity and expression for years. It took me years to finally figure out who I was. But I'm an adult and I'm nearer to the end of my journey with gender than the beginning. But imagine a ten-year-old being told the things that I was said. Imagine how you would have felt in elementary school if you were told that you were broken or evil and destroying society by simply existing as who you are. Imagine if one of your kids was told those things. Well, here's the thing. Right now, you are the people telling the kids those things. Trans kids aren't stupid. They aren't ignorant of adult politics. They know about the rhetoric being used against them. They know about all the people who would say all of the horrible things to me to them if they got the chance. And they know that those are the people that are backing the policies that they are currently being subjected to. Every single transgender kid in Newport News is being told through your inaction that you support the hatred being displayed against them. Finally tonight, I want you to, to reflect on the toxic environment that these policies have created for your students. I said that last month that you, the board, have the opportunity and the power to stop this and stop telling our kids that they don't belong and that they're lesser. As Ivan the Terrible of Russia once said, silence is consent. Now, I know it doesn't feel great to be called out from beyond the grave by one of history's most infamous tyrants, but trust me when I say your trans kids are suffering much worse every day. Thank you. Reverend Michael Burnett. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, Madam Superintendent. I know we're back here talking about the same issue we've been talking about for several months now. I'd apologize if I felt bad about it, but I'm here, so obviously I don't. And I'm not going to give another, another echo of another big pathos or ethos argument. I'm not here to make some big, grand, ethical point. There have been plenty of those made. They've been very valid. They've been very good. We don't necessarily need another one of them in the chorus. I'm, I want to make a very pragmatic statement and an outright political one. Especially as nonpartisan elected officials, I know that y'all are very wary of being seen as catering to special interests. And when we're talking about protections for minority groups, that, word, that phrase special interest gets bandied about a lot. The irony is in the discussions we've had in the last few months in this room since last fall, with very few exceptions, Every voice that I've heard arguing in favor of adopting the policies which you have adopted has come from one special interest group. They've even identified themselves with uniform stickers. They made it very clear they're from one organization. They had a rally right here in town attended by some of the members of our school board about this very issue ahead of the October meeting. They are a well-organized, well-funded, and powerful special interest group, sure. But they are ultimately one special interest group a political activist group whose political action parent group has, as part of their stated priorities, a mission of installing members of one particular religious persuasion in all levels of government. These meetings don't fly under the radar. 
I've seen the YouTube statistics. They get seen hundreds of times, which inevitably spawn thousands of water cooler conversations over the course of a month. Folks know what's going on in this room. The voters are paying attention, and they're going to notice if a plethora of voices representing an entire cross-section of this community, including the voices of your own employees, parents of children in your schools, folks from diverse socio-political orientations and religious or non-religious persuasions, not to mention the voices of your own educators union and the ACLU are being drowned out by one activist group representing one socio-political orientation and one religious persuasion and seemingly even one particular congregation as nonpartisan elected officials I understand the hesitance to be seen as catering to special interest groups but the truth is if you're really worried about cozying up to special interests you need to be worried about where you stand right now it's not too late. Repeal the procedural changes made back in November and at least put this issue to the vote it deserves so the voters can see who stands where. Thank you. David Bruckman. I'm here to implore the board to reverse the 2023 changes to the JBP policy regarding transgender students. Uh, it turns out that trans students hate this. It is harmful to them. Um, if you are motivated only by the state's threat of legal action, um, I ask that at the least you repeal the prohibition on gender-based participation in sports in section 3EH of the JBP uh, since the state law you're deferring to uh, in Virginia Code 22.1 explicitly applies to activities and events that do not include athletics. Um, more broadly, children who do not come out to their parents generally have a good reason not to. Um, rejection by the family has a causal link with homelessness, abuse, um, and suicide, and a student's right to safety is a higher priority than a parent's right to information. Um, the Protect Every Kid lobby, who has successfully agitated for this, is a transparent, all lives matter dismissal of the need to protect people most evidently under attack. Um, in addition to trans students hating this, your constituents hate this, and since its passage without a vote, I've been asking who supported it. Um, largely not received answers, um, and from those from whom I've received answers in the negative, I'm still waiting for a public action against it. Thank you. Caitlin O'Brien. This is a letter that I delivered to the board uh, last month from the ACLU. Dear school, school board, you are being given this letter because your district adopted the Virginia Department of Education 2023 model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia public schools. School boards have an obligation to comply with various federal and state laws that prohibit discriminations on the, uh, discrimination on the basis of gender identity. The 2023 model policies fundamentally conflict with those laws and their adoption could expose your district to legal liability. School boards should unequivocally express their commitment to prohibiting discrimination against trans non-binary students and their policies should be consistent with their legal obligations to do so. The Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution and Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, Title IX, both prohibit discrimination against transgender students, which is considered discrimination on the basis of sex. In 2021, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down a school board's discriminate, discriminatory restroom policy and held that Gavin Grimm, a transgender student, must be permitted to use the restroom that aligned with his gender identity, Grimm versus Gloucester County School Board, uh, as amended... The court made clear that there is no evidence upon which school boards can justify discriminatory restroom policies and that such policies are based on sheer conjecture and abstraction. Further, Title II of the American with Disabil Americans with Disabilities Act um, prohibit discrimination 
and ensure equal opportunities for persons with disabilities in state and local government operations, including public schools. In August 2022, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that gender dysphoria meets the definition of a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Williams versus Kincaid. Uh, many, though not all, transgender people experience gender dysphoria. As a result, schools will often be required to provide accommodations to transgender students in order to provide access to educational and extracurricular programs for those students and avoid discrimination. These accommodations might include use of the student's affirming name and pronouns, access to restrooms and other facilities that align with their gender identity, participation in programs and activities consistent with their gender identity, um, and confidential access to school counselors, all of which the 2023 model policies functionally dictate withholding from many transgender students. The 2023 model policies contain only vague references to these obligations under federal law and frame them as exceptions to the general policy mandates set out in that document. As a result, school districts are left to determine the reach of both the model policies and federal law for themselves, especially where the model policies appear to mandate outcomes uh, that conflict with federal law. Gotcha. Next, we have Mary Voss. Hello, uh, Mary Voss, teacher, parent, and graduate um, in NNPS uh, from the Newport News Education Association. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of our NNEA president, Dr. James Graves, tonight. I am reading the rest of the ACLU of Virginia letter to school boards that Ms. O'Brien uh, began reading before me. All right. Uh, for example, the 2023 model policies require schools to have policies that would delineate restroom and locker room usage based on sex, which is defined as simply as biological sex. However, in most cases involving transgender students, this default rule will conflict with the Fourth Circuit's holding in Grimm, and therefore will con conflict with the school district's obligation not to discriminate on the basis of gender identity. Another section of the model policy similarly provides that when a school program, event, or activity, including extracurricular activities, is separated by sex, students must participate according to their sex rather than gender identity. The establishment of this default rule will necessitate a case-by-case -case analysis to determine the applicability of federal law to each scenario, making unlawful discrimination and litigation more likely than if the default rule were simply to allow students to participate in activities and use facilities in accordance with their gender identity. The next section is titled, Virginia Law Prohibits Discrimination Against Transgender Students. This previous section was about how federal law prohibits it. So moving on to state law, the Virginia Human Rights Act, VHRA, prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity in public accommodations, which are defined as all places offering or holding out to the general public goods, services, privileges, facilities, advantages, or accommodations. The purpose of the Virginia Human Rights Act is to safeguard all individuals within the Commonwealth from unlawful discrimination in places of public accommodation, including educational institutions. The 2023 model policies directly conflict with the Virginia Human Rights Act by requiring districts to disregard students' gender identity and force participation in activities and facilities access based on biological sex only. Because biological sex is not defined in the 2023 model policies and is not always determinable by clear and objective criteria, the application of this policy will inevitably be inconsistent, resulting in discrimination. Finally, the 2023 model policies, if adopted by your school district, will cause transgender students real harm. Schools that do not protect transgender and non-binary students from discrimination see lower school attendance, lower self-esteem, higher rates of depression, and higher rates of physical and sexual assault than schools that affirm and include those students. Please resend this cruel policy. Thank you for your time. Ron Lee. 
Good evening to you guys. I gave a little handout out um, to you guys, and I sent an email with a bunch of um, resources earlier today. This is a portion of the Virginia policies which were compared to each other. I just want to go over a couple of statistics and a couple of statements. Um, 275 state bills have been um, pushed this year already in 2024 targeting trans individuals. Um, over 500 in 2023. Uh, SCOTUS has rejected today to listen to a bathroom bill from a school. This one was in Ohio. Um, they keep rejecting these um, transgender school bills. And um, federal courts have overwhelmingly supported transgender rights for students and upheld uh, transgender rights. Um, actually, um, gender identity is a Title IX protection. So I just wanted to say that since that was kind of relevant today. Um, children are coming out sooner than in the past as being transgender. That's, that's caused a weird thing to happen. Um, historically, um, Lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals have had higher levels of education. Um, we're seeing that opposite effect for transgender kids. And the reason for that, they think, is probably because of bullying and a lack of inclusivity, representation in schools and curricula. A transgender youth is 3.7 times more likely than a cisgender youth to experience bullying, and 3.3 times more likely to miss school due to safety concerns. We have built a systemic problem which hold back stigmatized youth. I think everybody should have an equal shot at the basket, but we need to stop making some kids jump hurdles before they get to the free throw line. So here's some statistics about um, transgender students in Virginia. The Washington Post estimates that there are 4,000 transgender students in Virginia, and NPS is 2% of Virginia Department of Education, roughly. So if we peanut butter spread that number, there should be 81.6 transgender students in Newport News Public Schools. So how does that number relate? Um, you have 91 Native American students. You have 96 Pacific, and Pacific Islander and Hawaiian students, 81.6 trans. Mitchell High School has 81 mixed race students. And NPS residential programs have 91 students. In 2022, 30 NNPS graduates received a GED and 15 dropped out, which is a crazy low number. Congratulations on that. But that means that we have twice the amount of trans kids than dropouts and students who earn GEDs. NNPS has 41 um, has 41 schools. No, oh, sorry. Anyway, those are just some statistics I want to throw out there. They're out here. They're not seen. Thank you. I have a, an incomplete card, but I'm going to call the name or what I have. Um, Effie from Norfolk. Effie from Norfolk. Uh, good evening, my name is Effie and I'm here again, like many of you have already spoken tonight, uh, to speak out against Young Vin's uh, transphobic guidelines and their implementation here. Uh, to that end, I wanted to read an excerpt from a Texas trans teen's testimony against transphobe policies uh, that were being enacted in their own state, but which I think are certainly relevant here. Quote, my name is Caden Asher and I'm a transgender foster student alumni. I came out for the first time at 13. Growing up, I acted the part I was told to. When puberty hit, my body started to change and I began to hate myself. I could feel that there was something wrong with the way I looked, and that's when I realized I was trans. When I was 15, I met another trans person at my school and decided to finally come out to everyone. When I did, my assistant principal called my father and outed me without my permission. That day, when I got home, we got in a huge fight that led to me being held down on my own bed so I wouldn't move while my father yelled at me. It got to a point where I couldn't breathe because my dad's girlfriend was sitting on my chest and I screamed. My dad slapped me and told me to stop exaggerating." End quote. The story only gets worse from there, as you can imagine, to the point that this teenager had to be placed in foster care for their own safety. 
and only after years of being in foster care did Caden seek out the medical transition that seems to be the fixation of those who wish to strip trans students of their rights to privacy. Uh, for those who may not be aware, being trans is not just about hormones and surgeries, and especially for children and teenagers, the most important thing is to be socially accepted as the person they are, and I see no reason their privacy should be breached during an incredibly vulnerable time in their lives, especially when scenarios like Caden's are an all too common reality. Student safety and privacy should be safeguarded and upheld, and Yunkin's policies adopted here do the opposite of that. So I ask that you repeal them immediately. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanna thank um, everyone who came to speak this evening, we do appreciate um, your words. We will now move on to section three, the consent agenda, which includes 3.01 minutes from the special meeting, December 12, 2023. 3.02 minutes from the regular meeting, December 12, 2023. 3.03 financial reports, including the revenue report for December 2023, the expense report for December 2023, and the child nutrition reports for December 23, 2023. We have 3.04, the personnel report, 3.05, appointment of deputy clerk of the school board, and 3.06, budget transfer. At this time, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Thank you. Any discussion at this time? Okay. Please call the roll. Mrs. Elf. Four. Mrs. Edmund. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Mr. Harris. Four. Mrs. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries six zero. Okay. Thank you. That's me. <laughs> we'll now move on to section five, reports and information. We have 5.01, the elementary English K through five instructional materials. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Tonight we have Ms. Lori Wall, our Director of Elementary Teaching and Learning. She's gonna come before you to share with you the recommended elementary English K five instructional materials. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Good evening, Madam Chair Soros Law, Vice Chair Bess, Dr. Mitchell, and members of the board. My name is Lori Wall, Director of Elementary Teaching and Learning, and I'm here this evening to bring forth a recommendation from the Elementary English Textbook Adoption Committee. Last April, we shared with our board that the Adoption Committee had made a recommendation for a new Elementary English Core program. The textbook adoption committee was formed and included representation from all across all schools and K-12 collaborative departments. The committee was comprised of two teachers from each grade level, kindergarten through fifth grade, and teachers were selected by their administrators to serve on this committee. Additional members included two reading specialists, two administrators, an ESL and special education instructional specialist, and the elementary English supervisor. The committee received textbook proposal packages from nine vendors and reviewed them with a common rubric that evaluated three components. Component one, alignment. Component two, instructional design and student experience. And component three, instructional planning and support. The three vendors with the highest scores were selected to give presentations and host a Q&A session for the committee as part of the evaluation process. After these sessions, the committee voted and the two vendors with the highest scores were selected to enter the negotiation process. At the conclusion of the negotiation process, the committee deliberated and cast their vote in March of 2023 and determined a recommended vendor for adoption. However, at the same time, the State Board of Education had expanded the Virginia Literacy Act requirement for each local school board to provide a core program of literacy instruction that aligns with the science-based reading research and provides evidence-based literacy instruction from students in kindergarten through grade three to students in kindergarten through grade five. To support the compliance of this requirement, 
the VLA required the VDOE to recommend instructional programs for approval by the Virginia Board of Education. Therefore, in April 2023, we were unable to bring the recommendation forward because the Virginia Board of Education had not voted on a complete list of materials through grade five. Just last month, a special Virginia Board of Education meeting was held and the State Board of Education approved the recommended list of instructional programs and the program that our committee recommended last April was included on this list. Therefore, this evening, I'm, bring, I'm here to bring forth the recommendation of the English Adoption Committee. The Elementary English Textbook Adoption Committee recommends Benchmark Advance as the core instructional program for grades kindergarten through grade five. The VDOE released a recommended instructional programs guide that communicates the final results of a multi-phase rigorous review process used to identify the best-in-class K-5 core instructional programs. Benchmark Advance received high ratings across all grade levels. Since our committee began this process over a year ago in August of 2022, we are one of the first divisions in our area to complete the adoption process and make a recommendation. On this slide are a few of the strengths of the program that were also highlighted in the VDOE Instructional Program Guide. I'll just let you take a minute to review. As you can see, the program offers teacher direction, particularly for novice teachers, to include clear guidance and support on the connection between instruction and assessment. In addition, students have opportunities to engage with text and task that promote knowledge building in the areas of science and social studies. If approved, we will begin implementing, imp implementing the next steps for purchase, training, and curriculum development to prepare for the implementation as expected by the VDOE for the 24-25 school year. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. And at this time, Dr. Rogers and I are available to answer any questions. All right, questions from the board? Going once. <laughs> Here's a lots of quick question. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you. For those that may be watching and may not have the in-depth knowledge, the, those that have been in education is there, for their careers, could you explain um, the difference between a core instructional program and a curriculum because we saw in the last slide well then we'll be developing a curriculum so you can you kind of share how they integrate with each other sure. so the difference between a core instructional program and an instructional excuse me curriculum are two different things so the curriculum is the big context that we use to teach from day to day so a teacher would pull out a curriculum and follow the curriculum. And of course our curriculum is uh, custom and we use the Virginia Stan Standards of Learning to create the curriculum. An instructional resource supports the curriculum. So uh, what we've put up for adoption is not the curriculum, it's an instructional resource that supports the curriculum that teachers are teaching. Does that help? Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we want to thank you all for your um, attention to this serious matter for us because, I, as you can tell, we have been reaching out and letting uh, Dr. <laughs> Mitchell know we had questions and you addressed each and every one of them in your presentation and we do appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. Thank yes. So now we'll move on to 5.02. We have new and revised policies, Dr. Mitchell. Yes, we do. Ms. Tracy Brooks, a special assistant to the superintendent, is here to present several of the new and revised policies. I know you are quite familiar with Ms. Brooks as she seems to come every other month um, as she is updating um, some of the policies and bringing us new. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Mitchell. Of the 25 policies, procedures, and exhibits that the School Division's Policy Committee reviewed, it is a pleasure to share highlights from nine of the new and revised policies with you this evening. 
All of the policy-related documents represent the work of a policy committee, which includes two school board members, principals, teachers, administrators, and our school board and school division attorneys. We've placed the nine new and revised policies that I will talk to you about in three groups. First are those that are required by new state and federal legislation. Second are the policies that we either develop or revise to support best practices in the school division. And third are the policies in the sixth policy chapter of our five-year timeline, which is on general school administration. Now, there are three policies resulting from recent legislation that I will share this evening, and they address the school division's annual operating budget process, our technology acceptable use policy, or AUP, and high school graduation requirements. Our first policy addresses the school division's annual operating budget. The Code of Virginia requires school divisions to hold one work session and at least one public hearing during the budget planning process. The state code changed the requirement to publish notice of the public budget public hearing from 10 days in advance of the hearing to seven days, which is reflected in our policy revision. The next state code change affects our technology acceptable use policy by prohibiting school division students, employees, and contractors from downloading or using any application, including TikTok or WeChat, or accessing any website developed by ByteDance or Tencent Holdings on any device or equipment issued, owned, or leased by the school board including mobile phones, desktop computers, laptops, tablets, or other devices capable of connecting to the internet. And this policy is a part of the state's effort to promote or to protect organization data and privacy. Now, over the years, the school board has worked to ensure that students transferring into our schools from other states are evaluated to determine the number of standard and verified credits earned to enable them to graduate on time. A new federal law weighs specific courses required for graduation for children of certain federal employees if similar coursework was completed satisfactorily in the student's former school division. So under the new law, the superintendent may accept exit or end of course exams required for graduation from the student's former state or nationally normed reference achievement test in lieu of Virginia tests. So we've added these requirements to our current graduation policy. Now next, I'd like to highlight three policies that support best practices in the school division. First are revisions that we are proposing to our current student and staff wellness policy, followed by two new policies, one that addresses student participation in commencement ceremonies, and another on voter registration opportunities for our high school students. We revised the student and staff wellness policy to better align it with federal requirements for participating in national school lunch, breakfast, and summer feeding programs, and with our current school division best practices. These include the designation of a wellness lead at each school and workplace to provide programs that promote healthy eating and physical activities for students and staff, and providing guidance on school-sponsored fundraisers, nutrition awareness, physical activities, and environmentally friendly practices, such as using locally grown foods, and developing school gardens. And in complying with federal law, the revised policy also requires the school division to evaluate the implementation of the wellness policy at least once every three years. Now, next is a new policy that addresses participation in commencement ceremonies, and we all look forward to recognizing the achievement of our high school students. The policy states that participating in commencement is a separate process from graduating, and that students who have completed all of their diploma requirements must then be deemed eligible to participate in their commencement ceremonies. Now, under the eligibility process, students who have satisfied 
satisfactorily met the school division's requirements to earn a high school diploma, but have been charged or found guilty of an offense under Virginia law requiring them to attend an alternative education program, may participate in commencement only if the student is found not guilty and the charges are dismissed. The student must also provide documentation of the dismissed charges to the school division at least two weeks prior to the date of the scheduled commencement exercise in order for the student to participate in the ceremony. Our next new policy addresses voting and the school board's support of education programs that teach students the right of citizens to vote and the role and importance of voting and civic engagement. The policy allows for nonpartisan voter registration programs for our high school and adult education students and encourages the Newport News voter registration registrar's office to hold voter registration opportunities in our high schools on a regular basis. <laughs> the last three policies that I will review with you this evening are part of our five-year review of our 11 policy chapters and we're excited to be in the fourth year of our review which will begin with our chapter on general school administration. Now many of the policies in this chapter were reviewed in 2020 so most of our revisions were to update and streamline the policy language for greater clarity and to reflect current school division best practices in the procedures. The three policies taken from the general school administration policy chapter address the school's the superintendent's evaluation and two annual reports, the school division state report, which is a new policy that reflects a current practice, and the school division's report to the community. Now, the Code of Virginia requires school boards to evaluate their division superintendent annually using the state's uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria. So in keeping with this requirement, we revised the school division's seven performance standards in the superintendent's evaluation to reflect the eight performance objectives adopted by the state. And you may recall that we updated the teacher and administrator performance standards during during our review of the Human Resources Policy Chapter last year. Now, our next policy regarding the school division annual state report is new, but it reflects a current requirement that the school division has complied with over the past several years. The report covers the work of the division for the preceding year, particularly in complying with the Virginia Standards of Quality, and is submitted to the State Superintendent of Public Instruction in the Department of Education. This last policy was renamed from the annual report to the school division community report. This report covers the activities and accomplishments of the school division students, staff, and community partners over the year, and it's submitted to the school board and submitted and disseminated to the public annually. So in terms of our next steps, the new and revised policies will come before the school board at your February 20th meeting. And once approved, the new and revised policies and procedures will be posted on our school division websites and disseminated to schools and public libraries. So this concludes my report this evening. I will be happy to answer your questions or to note your suggestions. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Comments or questions? Yes. Um, I'll just make a comment. I'm um, very thankful to the policy committee for taking on the student voter registration. I think in terms of we've talked about this for a number of years, um, and this supports students being citizen ready. Mm -hmm. So very excited that we have, I know we've informally had a voter registration, but now it's good to, that we'll actually have a formal policy on uh, encouraging students to uh, for voter registration and becoming citizen ready. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. Yeah, and can I add, um, it's aligned with state codes based on what I could see. Uh, also, the state code allows for the opportunity to complete an application form during the course of the day. So um, perhaps we can even deepen uh, the policy some more. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments? Thank you for keeping us aware.
Great. Thank you very much. We are at 3.03, .03. attendance report, 3.04, membership report, 3.05, construction report. Board members, you have received a copy of this report. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to item 5.06, comments by the superintendent. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. The National Archery in the School's Regional Tournament was held on January the 6th at Achievable Dream Middle and High School, and teams from Richneck Elementary, <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald Middle, and Minchville High earned first place in their divisions and are advancing to the state tournament in March. So congratulations to our regional archery champions. It's important to note that more than 200 students from 10 of our schools participated in this regional tournament. So a really good showing on our, of our students. As part of its ongoing outreach, our health and physical education department is hosting a webinar for parents and guardians on the dangers of vaping. This is tomorrow, January 17th from 6 to 7 p.m. It is co-presented by the American Heart Association and the webinar will address the dangers of vaping, looks for us, and resources. So please visit our website in order to register. And then last week, the EPA announced the Newport News Public Schools was awarded a clean bus, clean school bus grant in the amount of $525,000 to purchase 15 more propane school buses. So, and, in the past seven years, Newport News Public Schools has been replacing diesel fuel buses with propane buses. So propane not only reduces emissions, which of course is better for our environment, but it also saves our district thousands of dollars in fuels and maintenance costs each year. Newport News Public Schools currently has 153 po propane buses and the additional 15 will then bring our total to 168 which is more than half of our total fleet of 318 buses. So a total of 67 applicants across the country will receive a share of the nearly $1 billion awarded towards the Clean School Bus Program Grants Competition, and we are just really proud to be one of them. And of course, earlier today, we have referenced the recognition in the recognition portion of our agenda. This week is School Principals Appreciation Week. So I certainly want to take a moment to thank our school principals for their commitment to our students' academic, social development, and overall success. I've been a former principal. I recognize how difficult that role is. Greatly appreciate the work that you are leading in your schools. So thank you for your dedication. And for families, I'd like to remind you that on Thursday, January the 25th, it is a staff work day. Friday, January 26th is the Professional Development Day, so students do not report to school. Students will return on Monday, January the 29th for the first day of our second semester. So that concludes my comments this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. We'll move on to item six, another opportunity to hear from the public. Are there any additional cards? No, we are headed towards getting us out of here so we can get on our way safely home with the weather that we have outside. Um, I am going to begin, let's see, with Aaron Lynn well, this evening. Thank you. So our next stu superintendent student advisory meeting will be held tomorrow, and the major topic will be school safety. Mr. Mark Stewart, the Executive Director of Crisis Planning, Prevention, and Environmental Risk Management, will be attending to lead discussions. I also want to wish my fellow students good luck on the semester exams. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Mr. Brown. <clears throat> All right. Well, yes, good luck on the exams as well. <laughs> I'll echo that. Uh, the, we went over in our work session tonight our budget, so I'll say the same thing I say every January for the last 10 years. Every year that I've been on this board, we have voted for a budget increase, and this year will be no different uh, on my part. Um, and so excited about the budget. I know that we have some, we have some significant headwinds um, that we face mm -hmm. in terms of c pulling our budget together, but I know we'll, we'll do it. We always do. Uh, we always do pull that together. Um, excited about the K-12 
Capital Conference, uh, the VSBA Capital Conference um, next week. We'll be going up to, I'll be going up to uh, Richmond to talk to uh, the General Assembly and hopefully we will get some more support on school construction in terms of that 1% uh, sales tax and the uh, uh, re um, retention of cash capital at the end of the year. So i um, hoping to um, lobby well on some of those efforts and uh, looking forward to that and as well. Uh, look forward to, before we see you next time, the science fair. All the scientists that's want to get into the, some of the funnest parts of the year. Um, so looking forward to the science fair and uh, very much appreciate um, the opportunity to shake your hands, uh, young scientists, as you come across in that all-city science fair. So looking forward to that, and we'll see you again in February. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, do you have voice? To uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Ms. Amon? Sure. Um, I think some of my thunder has been stolen. I was going to likewise remind everyone <laughs> finals are next week. And for the parents that are listening, <laughs> finals are next week. So <laughs> make sure you get some sleep. Uh, take care of yourself. I know there are a lot of bugs going around. So stay healthy. Get through finals. Welcome back from break. Thanks. Ms. Alger? Um, just want, want to reiterate and say thank you to all the school principals. Um, mm -hmm. We've been out in uh, buildings and seeing the hard work that's happening out there, uh, especially during this time where there are assessments happening uh, and a lot of intervention. So thank you all for your hard work. Great. Dr. Best. And pretty much, Ms. Al, you stole my thunder. We have been out visiting <laughs> schools again. And again, happy Principals Appreciation Week. We've had an opportunity, opportunity to talk to some absolutely fantastic administrators who are very passionate about what they're doing, very knowledgeable. They've shared some things with us that we had not thought about or, or that they thought you know were more important maybe than we gave value to. And I just want them to know we really, really appreciate uh, what they're doing and what they have to say. Great. I'm going to, since um, Mr. Hunter's not here, I'm going to say great things are happening here in Newport News Public Schools. Wishing him a speedy recovery. Uh, the last part is I'm just going to kind of lift up our, our fearless leader here. Mm. She is doing a great job. Um, internally and externally <coughs> recently invited by the governors to hear um, his address only three schools in the state of Virginia <coughs> uh, superintendents were invited and, and Newport News was represented at that table um, and just the work that she is helping us undertake her and her very capable leadership team we really appreciate you guys focusing on I'm looking at mr. right back there in the back um, just really appreciating all that you all are doing. It means the world to us to stay focused on the thing that is a thing, and that's our students. So with that, I adjourn this meeting. 7.53. Not bad. <laughs>